Tonight I want to be in 1 Peter and the fourth chapter. We, um, I'm, I'm guessing that some, uh, some of our men probably fact-checked me this morning. I, off the top of my ha- head, counted 13 since the end of September, 13 preachers that have preached on the faithfulness of God, celebrating our 50th anniversary as a church and really celebrating 50 years of God's faithfulness. And I counted 13. Did y'all fact check me? Some of you guys would probably think of that. You have a critical spirit sometimes and you just want to just... Uh, oh, you trusted me. Wow. Oh, we reached a new level. Amen. All right. That's good. I'm not 100% positive it's 13. I just counted off the top of my head the men that I could think of that have preached. And I decided a long time ago I would hold off till the end. And, and so counting anniversary Sunday, which we had five, I think we've had 13. And so now it's my turn. And again, it's uh, when 13 men stand and preach on the faithfulness of God, uh, it seems as though there's nothing new you can say about God's faithfulness. At the same time, you can't say enough about God's faithfulness. Uh, even if you're saying the same thing, uh, it's, it's still needed and important. But and someone might have, I've gone back and listened to several of the messages, someone might have mentioned this, uh, but I don't think anybody took it as a text. And so uh, gleaning after the reapers, as I said this morning, trying to pick up what's been left in the corners of the field, First Peter chapter number 4, First Peter is a letter on suffering. Suffering, we are encouraged to suffer, if, you, if the will of God be so, that we suffer as a Christian. But not to suffer as an evildoer. In other words, don't live your life uh, that brings the wrath of God or the judgment of God on your life. But rather, uh, live your life so that the suffering that you experience are the tests that God allows to strengthen and try you and refine you as gold. And when you come down to the end of chapter number 14... The Bible says, I gave you that context so we wouldn't have to read a, a lot of extra scripture tonight, but verse number 19 of chapter 4, 1 Peter, the Bible says, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing, notice this, as unto a faithful creator. And that's what I want to speak on tonight, a faithful creator. Creator, Father, I pray that you would help us tonight. We pray you'll bless the reading of your word, both from the book of Haggai and now from 1 Peter. Because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And as we hear it, as we read it, as we seek to give the sense of it, Lord, we cannot help but be helped by it, strengthened by it, and encouraged by it. And now let us be mindful of this tonight. That we have a faithful creator. We ask it in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. We uh, have talked about for many, many weeks now on Sunday nights the faithfulness of God and, and what that means to us as Christians, what it means to us. And this, but this passage of scripture from the very beginning stuck out in my mind and has been. Uh, has been there for these uh, several months now because it ties the faithfulness of God <coughs> in, in a unique way to his creation, to the creative work of God. And if, and, and if we're to learn something from that, I, several of the commentaries have commented on this verse of Scripture and they, they said that volumes could be written on the on this truth or this thought in verse number 19 and still never exhaust all that is couched in these words. The, to commit the keeping of our soul unto him has been a common thread throughout many of the messages. But as unto a faithful creator has to have some meaning for us. What about God's faithfulness as our Creator is one of those Bible phrases upon uh, which in, in uh, many times people, Christians going through suffering might focus in on 1 Peter as an epistle 
and might think about this, that we commit the keeping of our souls unto him. But in what way does his creative work help us to trust him? What about God's creative uh, influence in the, in the universe helps us to have confidence in him? We're going to come back in just a moment. I want to just mention a couple things about the verse and then go into some thoughts and then I want to circle back to this. And first of all, just by way of reading and interpreting the scriptures, making sure we understand what's being said. It's talking about suffering for doing right, suffering as a Christian, if the will of God be so, think about this, it can be God's will for me to suffer for doing right. You say, That's, that is so contrary to our 2020 mindset, is it not? But yet, you, you, all you have to do is go back to the scriptures and find example after example of men and women who suffered for doing what was right to do. All you have to do is, is think on the years of martyr testimonies that we read every Sunday morning to realize that many times people have suffered for doing what is right. There is a mindset that comes from really, it comes from the world, but it really comes from, uh, from uh, paganism that says if you suffer, it must be because you've done something wrong to anger the gods. That you, and, and that's what you see in the friends, uh, and I use the term loosely, the friends of Job, when they say because of his suffering, it must be that he had been breaking orphans' arms and kicking widows out of their homes because otherwise he would not be suffering. And so that mindset comes from paganism. But we know from the scriptures that it may be God's will for me to suffer for doing what is right. And in such case, notice this, we are to commit the keeping of our souls to him. This emphasizes the importance of the immaterial part of man as opposed to the material part of man. You know, when we get in trouble, we go about, we get very worldly minded and start trying to save life, limb, health. But that is the, the most insignificant part of our life. It is really hard for us to get a hold of this because we, it is so ingrained in us. I mean, uh, uh, the Bible talks about what would a man give in exchange for his soul. Man loves himself. And so we fall back into that. But when we suffer for doing what is right, our focus needs to be on the soul, not the body. Commit the keeping of your soul. Notice... To him in well-doing. The way in which you commit your soul to him is you continue doing right. If you're suffering for doing right, to commit the keeping of your soul to him is continue doing right. Sometimes we have this idea that committing the keeping of our soul to him as unto a faithful creator. If we want to tie that to other verses... You know, occupy till he comes. If we want to tie that to other verses that, you know, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And we're not careful. We get this idea that we sit back, fold our arms, and just say, well, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. That's not what the Bible teaches. The way you commit the keeping of your soul to him as a, unto a faithful creator is you keep doing right. You, you commit the keeping of your soul to him in well-doing. You keep doing well even when it's hard, even when there's persecution, even when there's a cost to it. You keep doing what is right. You keep doing uh, well and that's, that's saying I trust God to care for me. And then it says here, and again, this is the last thing, and then I want to get into the message just by way of interpretation. Keeping of 
Commit the keeping of your soul to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. This ties the the, uh, characteristics of God in creation to our ability to trust him and count him faithful. Now let's think about that. Some of these truths involved in this. First of all, is that because we understand the, the uh, God as our creator, we know this about God. As I said this morning, <coughs> we are to, to continue to uh, gain more knowledge of God. And through the knowledge of God, he gives us exceeding great and precious promises, which, which enable us to escape the corruption that is in the world and be partakers of the divine nature. Amen. Second Peter chapter number one, verse four, that we covered this morning. But right now we are talking about the God as our creator. And think about this. What we know about God as our creator is that he has character. Now what we mean by that is that all of the good characteristics that we can think of are embodied in God. We talk about the essence of God or the character of God or the nature of God. That he is faithful, that he is just, that he is holy. He's also uh, compassionate. He is love, but he is also justice. And so the character of God, God has character. We know that from his creative work, that all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. It is one of the general characteristics of revelation throughout the Bible that God's attributes uh, are laid out in distinct moral qualities, that it brings out these attributes or the character of God rather than just the nature in which God may exist or choose to create, but rather his character as it relates to man, that God is faithful. The Bible talks about God as unchangeable. He is the immutable God. He does not change. He cannot change. God is a God, uh, the God, the creator, is a God that possesses character. And then let me say this, that carrying that thought of character to the next step, (coughs) This biblical phrase includes the truth that God has some regular method by which he operates. In other words, whatever God does, God continues to do. That does not mean that that on every given day, uh, every day is going to be exactly the same. But it means the character of God does not change. He operates within certain parameters that are dictated by his character, and he cannot go outside of those things. God cannot do wrong in order to do right. There are, there's a mindset that, well, God did wrong to Israel to cause them to do right. He never did wrong to Israel. He did to Israel exactly what their actions called for. He, he allowed judgment to come in their life because of their rebellion against God, because they refused to acknowledge uh, God uh, as, as the authority in their life. They ignored his precepts. They, they uh, ignored his counsel. They, they, they uh, killed the prophets. And so God allowed the enemies of Israel to come in and possess their lands and dispossess them from their lands. God was not doing anything wrong to them in order to do right. God was following his character. He was following his method because (coughs) the methodology, the regular habit of God is a quality of faithfulness. As unto a faithful creator means he is a creator that you can depend on. You can depend on him because he has some regular method. 
There's a, the, the person who is here and there and everywhere, whose belongings are never in their place, the person who, whose life follows no conceivable method, may have other attractive qualities, but faithfulness is not one of them. Somebody that is, their life is completely disjointed. They have no patterns to their life. They have no consistency, consistency to their life. They may sing like a sparrow, but you may not be able to depend on them to be there to sing because they have no character or no regular method. Listen, we, if we know anything about God as the creator, uh, he is exact in what he did. I mean, on day one and on day two and on day three and on day four and five and six and he rested on the seventh day. He's a God of absolute order. He's a God who follows a method. There are those who say that, uh, well, the evidence that, we, uh, that uh, there is no God, that, that we have evolved, is in the closeness of the DNA between man and chimpanzee. Now, <clears throat> I've had preachers introduce me as a chimpanzee. Uh, I had one preacher introduce me as the missing link as I was getting up to preach. He said, yeah, everything you read in your textbooks in school about the protruding forehead and the hairy knuckles, his Pastor Wagon shoots, this is, this is him. I had Brother Yates over in uh, Cass Lake introduce me as the Tasmanian devil preacher. And he said he just he starts off and he spins faster and faster as he goes. And uh, some of you aren't old enough to remember the cartoon, the Tasmanian devil. But at any rate, um, but they, they claim, they say, well, you know, uh, uh, the DNA between a man and a, and a chimpanzee is 95% the same. And so that proves that we are closely rated, related to the chimpanzee. And I've met a few people that I might agree would have a closer connection to a chimpanzee. But it, it points less to an evolutionary process and more to a faithful creator. Uh, let me ask you a question. You know, we, we have, we, we are uh, accustomed to having electricity. Amen? And our, I'm glad of it. Amen? I'm, I'm thankful for electricity. I, I like it. As long as it's not shocking me, I, I, I'm pretty pleased with electricity. And we sit here tonight and electricity is being used to light this room so that we can see the Word of God, we can see one another, Etc. Electricity is also being used in the furnaces to run the blowers to circulate the heat and etc. But when you drove here, you drove here in a car that has a battery in it, that has an electrical charge in it, that turned the starter and started the motor, ran the lights and the radio and whatever it took for you to get here. Then there's uh, more and more you see uh, around electric or hybrid cars and those cars being driven, motivated, moved by electricity. And just about any application you can find for electricity. Now, it's all the same basic principle of electricity, is it not? Amen? Isn't, isn't basically, I mean, I understand there's AC and DC, but as a, a common household current, alternating current, it's basically the same, no matter what its application or what its use, when my wife uses it, uh, she might use it to run the electric oven to cook me a pizza tonight. Um, I will use it in a little while when I do some computer work down the hall before I leave and go home. And you, does that mean that the electric oven is somehow evolved from the computer or vice versa? No. It just means that there is a common design used throughout all of these applications. The very fact that 
there are commonalities in DNA, that there are commonalities in, commonalities in blood and uh, tissue between what God has made. does not speak at all to evolution. It speaks to a methodology used by a faithful creator. We can look at what God has done and we can discover. Since his habits are regular, we can search for him in the word of God and find what God does or how God works. It doesn't mean that you can always anticipate exactly what God's going to do because we see through a glass darkly. But it does mean that we can always depend upon the character of God and his method is not really going to change. When we are disobedient, he will judge us in our life to correct us. We know that because we see it over and over again laid out in the word of God. When we do right, we know that he will bless. Amen. And he will lead and guide and fill us with the Holy Spirit. We can depend upon that, that, that methodology. Why? Because he is a faithful creator. There's two things that are helpful when we think about God's methods. One is that because God all through nature and history has been following one basic chosen method, we can study what he has been doing and find out to some extent what his method is and see what he will do. You say, well, wait a minute, what does that mean? When you look around, the world is becoming a more and more wicked place. What, is, what has God historically done when the world became more and more wicked? He judged the world. Is that not consistent with what the Bible says he's going to do? And that is consistent with what he has always done? And so we can look at that and say we see the judgment of God is coming. We get very myopic. Uh, what that means is we just focus on like one little thing. You know, we get one little problem. I've got a little, I've got a little sore here between my thumb and forefinger on this hand that I have no idea what I did. I could have picked up a sliver. I'm not really sure yet because I haven't had time to take a pocket knife and get digging in there. I may do that later tonight. I'm not sure. But it's amazing how much attention that little spot has demanded of me in the last two days. It's just like whatever else is going on, I'm always coming back to this little spot because it hurts. And so we, we get very myopic and we, we think only of our community. We think only of our state. We think only of our country. And God is dealing with the world. The world is becoming a more and more wicked place. God, listen, uh, all you have to do is go back and read the, of the account of the, the biblical flood. God judged the world. God will judge the world again. It's coming. It is, a, it is in agreement with his methodology. It is what he has always done and he will always do. We see that God has regular habits of procedure he does not deal with his creation now on one plan and then on another. I do not mean that there's not an old and a new covenant. But I am saying the old and the new covenant really work together. They are one plan of redemption through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see that God follows this singular method and so we can study it and discover it. And then, secondly, we can observe this about him having a method. And that is, a good method is not to be set aside every now and then because it might seem not to meet the exact needs. In other words, God doesn't change because now we live in 2020. Man, sinful man is the same. It doesn't matter what form your vices take. It doesn't matter how available they may be to you through electronic means more available than they used to be when I was a child or growing up as a teenager. But God does not change because the times have changed. We need to understand that God has character. Our faithful creator has character. He has a, a regular method. 
And then thirdly, that God uh, has a, an object in mind. Listen, when God created the heavens and the earth, when he uh, 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 formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, breathed in the nostrils the breath of life in Adam, and man became a living soul. God did not do that just to say, you know what, I think I, I have a fancy, I think I have a, a whim, I'm just going to do this and see what happens. He had a goal in mind. How do you know that? He's a faithful creator. And I'm, you say, well, wait a minute. Why, I thought you were supposed to be talking about the faithfulness of God. I am. I'm trying to explain to you why we can commit the keeping of our soul to him. It's because he is a faithful creator. He has a goal. He has a name. He has an object that he is trying to produce in my life. Faithfulness is fidelity to your aim or your object. Let me talk to men here as husbands and fathers and ask you, what is your goal, your aim, your purpose for your home and for your family? Can you lay out in simple terms what is your aim? What is your purpose? What is your goal? And whatever that is, if you are a faithful man, everything you do will be for that goal, for that aim, and for that purpose. Do you think God is any less faithful as our creator? He has an aim and a purpose. God has an idea for you, child of God, and that is to give you, the Bible says, to give you an expected end. God has a plan for where you're going to end up. He has since he created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He's had a plan for where you will end up. And everything about his being a faithful creator points to that end. He has provided for you a means of salvation. He has provided for those that are saved. A method of sanctification to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all in accordance with the aim and the goal of our faithful creator. And then number four, the last characteristic of our faithful creator is that of responsibility. Think about this when... When you, if you create something, you take some measure of responsibility for it. When uh, a man and a woman, when they commit their lives together and exchange their vows before God and, and they uh, unite together and they uh, bring forth children, they are, by the very act of having those kids, of those children being conceived, they are, in fact, to be taking responsibility for those children. The very act of their coming into being implies that you're going to take care of them, that you're going to, to watch over them and be responsible for them. Many of the laws in our culture are based on that. If you do not control your children, they'll, they'll come after the parents. Why? Because you're supposed to be in control. You're supposed to be in charge. And is God any less responsible? When he has... Listen, God is not an unwilling participant in your life. God volunteers to take responsibility for your life. He says to you, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. That God will pour out to you such blessings that you will not be able to contain it. That God will care for you and meet your needs. But my God, 
shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ, hey, Christ Jesus. Hey, he willingly takes responsibility for you as a faithful creator. I don't know about you, but that means something to me. That God is not just bound by some ill-conceived idea or concept he had in eternity past. He's not coerced into caring for me. He voluntarily does so. That's, he's not just the creator. He's a faithful creator. That which he has created, he takes a personal interest in. What an important thing it is for us to understand the character of God, the methodology of God, the aim or the object of God. That all of these things belong to the category of the faithfulness of him as unto a faithful creator. The one that we entrust our souls to is that faithful creator. He is strong to preserve as well as he has made. Think about this. The Bible says not only by Christ were all things made that are made, but it also says that by him all things consist. They keep going not by the force of nature, but by the supernatural force of God that created it. And when he so desires, he can stop it all like that. The heavens and earth now, that now are going to be melt with a fervent heat. There'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Hey, he has no problem with that. And I want you to understand that he created you through Adam. But he also says that we are created also when we get saved. We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Think about this, Christian. That means that God has a purpose and an aim in your life. He has a method by which he wants to get you there. And he takes responsibility for you as his child. When he saved you, he didn't just say, okay, you're a member of the saved, go sit in the corner until I come back. No, he said, I make you my child. I, I, I become your father and I'll be a father to you and you'll be my sons and daughters. That's taking responsibility for us. And Paul says, he knows what we can take. And he'll not suffer us to be tempted above that we are able. But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. He fashioned me. He refashioned me in Christ. Where can my soul be more secure than to commit the keeping of it? To him as unto a faithful creator. He's made a covenant with us. He made a covenant when he created us. He's made covenant with men down through Old Testament history. He has a covenant with us in Christ, the New Testament, the new covenant. And he is faithful and ever remains true to himself, to his character, to his method, to his aim and purpose. And to his responsibility to carry it out. So we can commit the keeping of our soul unto him as unto a faithful creator. If you, we talk, we've talked for weeks now about God is faithful. And that's, all of that is true. But tonight I just want you to think about as we get ready to leave. Think about him as a faithful creator and how that impacts our ability to commit the keeping of our soul to him. Almost all of the men that have preached on God's faithfulness have tied it into the fact that because God is faithful, we can trust him. We can, and, all, and it has been consistent throughout all of these messages, all of these weeks. But sometimes we just need to stop and think about the character of God as a faithful creator and what his creative work means 
about Him. And the more we learn and know about Him, the more confident we can be. Well, I, what I'm trying to do tonight is not just tell you you can trust God. I'm trying to tell you you can trust God because, because He's a faithful Creator. Because of that, we see that he's got a method. We see that he's got a purpose. We see that he takes responsibility for his creation. We see that when it goes off the rails, that he brings judgment to, to straighten it back, uh, to get it back where it needs to be. God takes responsibility for it. And so back in our text, the Bible says we can commit the keeping of our souls. Think about this. The soul is the important part, not the phys this physical world. The, this world passes away. This world is the temporal. The next is the eternal. We get so focused in on the material things. And, and listen, we, all, we have to be salt and light. You hear me say this all the time. We have to be salt and light, but I also recognize that God's got a plan. And the judgment of the world is part of that plan. So we can commit the keeping of our souls to him. How? In well-doing. Keep doing what is right. That shows that you're trusting God. When you stop doing right in order to preserve life. When you stop doing right in order to make your, your life easier. When you stop doing right because it's unpopular. When you stop doing right because it's, <coughs> it's not the accepted thing. You are not committing the keeping. You're not trusting God. So we commit the keeping of our soul to him. How? In well doing as unto that faithful creator. He is a faithful creator. Amen. Father, I pray that you would help us tonight. This thought has been burning in my mind and heart for many, many weeks now. Lord, I, I always feel like I have not adequately explained what's in my mind and on my heart. But God, I pray that tonight the help of the Holy Spirit using His sword, the spirit, a sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, has spoken to our hearts about the fact of who you are as our creator and what that means for us and why we can commit the keeping of our soul to you. The most precious thing we have is not our physical life, is not even our health, it's not our comfort. The most precious thing we possess is the spirit of man or the soul with, with the, the immaterial part of man that will abide forever. God, I pray that you would help us to understand that the way we commit the keeping of our soul, that important and precious part of man, the way we commit that to your keeping is to continue doing right in, in well-doing. Father, they, may we stay faithful the hours and days in which we live, we still pray that Christ will return in 2020. We look for it. We long for it. But Lord, if it's not in your purpose and plan, may we consistently and continually in 2021 commit the keeping of our soul to you by continuing to do what is right. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed as we stand to our feet.